I'm Mark Edwards and welcome to Travelog. I've taken a brisk 45 minute flight east from Beijing to the coastal city of Qingdao, arguably the home of beer in China. I've been told that it has a fantastic blend of European and Chinese architecture, as well as being an extremely popular seaside holiday resort. So let's go and explore. Qingdao's Liuting International Airport is situated 30 kilometers north of the city, and you can take a swift 20-minute bus into the city center. Straight away, you'll get that I'm on holiday vibe, even if you're not. That's thanks to the breath of crisp sea air that greets you as soon as you arrive in Qingdao. At first sight, you might be forgiven for thinking that you can't possibly be in a port city in Shandong province in East China. As you emerge into the city centre, you'll get the distinct impression that you've got off at a 19th century Bavarian village. With its German legacy almost totally intact, Qingdao prides itself on its unique appearance, and some even go as far as calling it China's Switzerland. That might be a little too much, but its marriage of Chinese and European architecture, allied to its proximity to the sea and its many beaches, make Qingdao a perfect holiday getaway. Thank you very much. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. There's an absolute plethora of activities to enjoy here, and you'll feel the weight of history everywhere you go. In the late 19th century, the might of international politics thrust what was at the time a small scenic fishing village into the limelight on the world stage. The assassination of two German missionaries that year was used as a pretext by the German Kaiser Wilhelm II to force the Qing government to lease Qingdao to Germany for 99 years. The lease came into effect in 1898 and this small coastal village was set on the path to becoming the fourth largest seaport in China. It's a great place for strolling. The city's green credentials are further reinforced by its many parks and the Qingdao Shan Gongyuan is especially worth visiting because of the added attraction of its underground fort. It's a vast network of underground fortifications that the Germans themselves destroyed in 1914. All that's left today is the underground command post. Okay. So uh, this is, uh, we're just about to enter the underground layer for German troops, so the underground command post that was built in 1899 and it looks uh, quite scary. Well, jing, jing, jing. <laughs> it's a thoroughly enjoyable visit as you're literally thrust into the front line in a claustrophobic, hands-on experience guaranteed to appeal to all ages. The atmosphere is palpably scary, especially if you've come on a day with few other visitors. Dark, dank, and I'd venture to say an ideal setting for a low-budget horror movie. Whether you're coming to read about the history, feel the history, or relive it, you won't be disappointed. You can take a look around the old living quarters, the canteen, the boiler room, and the many escape hatches and secret tunnels, all buried three stories underground. So I'm uh, heading up to the watchtower, which is where the German army would have uh, given out their instructions. Um, there's a reinforced steel parapet and turret that revolves, and it's got 20 centimetres of reinforced steel, in case it came under heavy fire, and hopefully there won't be any of that today. <laughs> yeah. 
Luckily, no heavy gunfire, just a nice little girl. Can you see her? <laughs> it's all well and good getting hands on and reliving the lives of early 20th century German soldiers, but it's time for a bit more history. So, uh, finished our tour of the underground lair and it really was very impressive to see how much money and resources the Germans put into building that place and it makes sense because of its geographical location it's a lot colder in there the Qingdao War Museum highlights the main players from this period of history through exhibits such as Japanese German and Chinese guns parchments documents, testimonials and photographs. At the time, Qingdao made an ideal deep water base for the German Navy and it was protected by a 2,000 strong garrison. But the Germans weren't the only ones to appreciate Qingdao's strategic importance. The city was the object of an international tug of war when Japan, anxious to acquire a foothold in China, spotted that Germany's influence in the East had weakened due to the events unfolding on the battlefields of Europe. What then ensued is commonly referred to as the Siege of Qingdao, the only major land battle in East Asia during the First World War. Then, in 1919, much to the fury of the Chinese, Qingdao was ceded to Japan under the Treaty of Versailles. This led directly to the outbreak of the May the 4th movement, a crucial event in the formation of the national Chinese consciousness. The German occupation, though relatively brief, has created something of a tourist haven. During the early 20th century, the city was split into European, Chinese and business quarters. And to this day, strolling the streets of the European concession is a real eye-opener. On the south slope of the Signal Hill, we chance upon a massive German villa. The magnificently built mansion was the former residence of the German governor. The entire estate covers 26,000 square meters, and it's undoubtedly one of the most impressive structures in the city, akin to a huge castle-like palace with spiral staircases, Tudor-style beams, vaulted ceilings and stucco balconies. There was no extravagance spared in its construction, with much of the materials shipped in from Europe. In many ways, it reminds me of the stately homes that you can find dotted around the United Kingdom with their large entrance halls, lavish paintings and opulent decorations. Used by Mao Zedong in 1958, which is incidentally why it wasn't damaged during the Cultural Revolution like many of the other foreign buildings were, the mansion is now a hotel come museum. You can take a look at the very room used by the chairman, which has been left exactly as he liked it, with hard mattresses, soft couches and lots of spittoons. These days you'll also be able to find different exhibitions that take place in the gazebo, such as a photographic history of Qingdao, which was on when we were there. So, picture this. It's the turn of the 20th century and you're the recently appointed governor of Qingdao, all the way from Germany. You also have a bottomless expense account. What do you do? Well, you build an extravagant house, like the governor did. Unfortunately for him, the bill went straight to the Kaiser Wilhelm II of almost two and a half million tiles of silver. The governor was promptly sent back to Germany and sacked, but we get to see the remains. Right. Let's see what almost two and a half million tiles of silver can get you in 1903. And uh, one of the main questions I'm sure you're wondering is, how many rooms in this whole building? Well, 30 big rooms. And some of the few facts that I've learnt here, if you have a quick look, that is probably just a normal fireplace to you, but 
adding in the fact that there are 30 rooms, each fireplace in each room is completely different. Let's have a look around. And all of these chandeliers up here, if you have a quick look, all of these chandeliers up here are all different as well. And they still remain. They're exactly uh, how they were. Obviously, the light bulbs have been changed, but they're exactly the same as they were 100 years ago. And we've got some great views on the outside. I almost feel like an estate agent right now. This is the former governor's bedroom. And you can see over there is a single bed. And these would have been the inhabitants of the bedroom. I think, I assume that must be the governor. And uh, that's the tour of the house. Each of the different rooms has a distinct style. But all in all, the moral of the story when it comes to this fantastic tourist spot is that expense accounts are never bottomless. But the governor really should be commended for his vision that lost him his job. As if the Ying Bingwan, as it's known in Chinese, doesn't have it all, you just need to walk outside a few yards and you'll be greeted by breathtaking views from the hilltop. So at the very end of the 19th century, Qingdao was ceded to the Germans after their leader, Kaiser Wilhelm, had kept his eye on it as he thought it would be a strategic location for them in the east. Now, they were only here for around 15 years, but the mark that they made then can still be very seen now, as you can see with the building behind us. Whilst you're in the mood for strolling, there's no better place than in and around Badaguan, whatever the weather. It literally means eight passes. Famous for its tree-lined streets, gardens and European architecture, it lies in the east of Qingdao, with the Taiping Mountain on the one side and the Yellow Sea on the other. Right by the number two beach, in fact. For anyone who's into leafy suburbs, this part of Qingdao is a real treat. Each street is lined with a single type of tree or flower, which is how the locals recognize which street they're on. In fact, the proud locals often say that anyone who comes to Badaguan will never lose their way because the flowers and trees are the best possible guides. Badaguan is basically a conglomeration of several crisscrossing roads. The eight roads are all named after eight strategic passes on the Great Wall, in and around Beijing. You'll definitely get a gentle, quiet suburban feel as you pass the hundred or so western villas on display here. With its proximity to the ocean and its all year round sea breeze, it's easy to see why this area is chosen by so many affluent people as their home. There's a particularly high concentration of holiday houses here as well. So why not come in the summer and rent yourself a historic villa? You could say that it's a great area in all seasons, with its fragrant smells and shade from the trees, keeping everything dry and cool, whether it's raining or it's sunny. Next to the eight passes and slightly east of the beach, you'll find a giant outcrop of rock with a Russian-style villa built on top. Due to the type of stone used to build the villa, the locals have given it the nickname Hua Shilou, which means colourful rock building. It's a five-storey structure of stone and marble, with a large turret at the top to add to the Gothic feel. Originally the home of a Russian aristocrat, this top-class piece of real estate dating from 1932, combines an interesting mix of Greek, Roman and Gothic influences. It's also the added fact that the inside is filled with Chinese furniture within rooms that are distinctly European. It's not too pleasant out there, but I've got a feeling I'll be able to have a, a better view of Qingdao from above.
Well, the rain may dampen our clothes, but not our spirits. Let's see if we can find the secret passage that leads out directly from the house to the seashore. Or well, so I'm told. So, like any place on Earth, or most places on Earth, Qingdao, unfortunately, is not averse to the odd downpour and heavy wind like we've got today. Uh, that said, it does teach you when travelling to uh, always be prepared, and in this case, reminds you of where Qingdao used to be as a tiny little fishing village, and they had to put up with diverse weather like this going out to get their food just for sustenance. Something you will really appreciate from up here is how even on good days, the waves come crashing down far more powerfully on the east coast than they ever do on the south. Which begs the question, would you have been man enough to go out on days like this? Even if your livelihood depended on it like it did for the fishermen in the 19th century. But it's not all about hanging out by the beach when you're in Qingdao. There's so much fun to be had taking in the culture of this fascinating city. For example, you can make your way over to the restored Tianhou Temple. It's a 20 minute walk eastward from Baraguan and is dedicated to the heavenly queen Tianhou. Actually, the temple also moonlights as the Qingdao Folk Museum. <laughs> You can take as active a role as you want here, but when you go through the doorway, just remember the Chinese saying, Nan Zhou Niu Yo, meaning left foot first for a man and right foot first for a woman. So Tianho Temple was built over 500 years ago, which means that it actually predates Qingdao city itself. And a lot of the cultural relics are still available for you to see here. I've managed to find myself a relatively dry spot as it's just started raining, but I don't really feel like I'm uh, absorbing any of the culture. So I'm going to see if I can make a break for it into the uh, main temple area. Well, can't always uh, plan for the best weather on holiday and uh, I've obviously planned very badly travelling today. However, I think it's quite apt that we've arrived at the Tianho Temple in Qingdao, which is primarily dedicated to the goddess of the sea, Mazu, who would look after the sailors out on the coast. And I think on a day like today, they could probably use all the help they can get. There are other gods here in the temple that used to worship, but this is the main one. Mazu is worshipped widely in the southeast coastal areas of China and across Southeast Asia, where seafaring traditions are strong. The real-life Mazu, so the story goes, was a lady named Lin Monyang, who was born in the year 960 on Meizhou Island off the coast of Fujian province. Mazu is usually depicted together with two guardian generals, known as the Thousand Miles Eye and With the Wind Ear. They're said to have been two demons who Mazu subdued and turned into loyal guardians and friends. According to popular legend, Mazu was taught the mysteries of the Tao by a priest and subsequently began a lifetime of selfless charity, guiding ships into harbor and saving sailors from drowning. Mazu aside, this particular temple is multi-denominational as other gods are worshiped here. Among them, the dragon king, and the god of wealth. Well, safe in the knowledge that Mazu is looking over us, we decide to head on down to the harbour for some sailing lessons. My first sailing lesson. Woohoo! We're using the motor first to get out.
The well, trick is just to try well. and keep your balance. At the moment, I'm managing well. So step one of sailing, done. Don't fall into the water. <laughs> Engines off. Once the mast is up, you're ready to go. Not exactly a professional yet, but uh, just uh, being given my first lesson. It's very exciting. Hopefully at some point they might even let me, uh, what, I don't even know how to say that, uh, use the rudder, be the captain for a second. Um, but at the moment, just enjoying it with, uh, with my teacher here. Don't worry if you don't know how to sail, never been on a boat or never even seen the sea. The teachers are all extremely professional and more importantly in my case, extremely patient. In fact, there are people ready to help, whatever level of sailor you see yourself as. So we've taken a quick breather as uh, the winds pretty much died out, but I've been really impressed by the sheer enthusiasm of the crew uh, trying to teach me pretty rookie on my first day, first lesson ever. However, really have been impressed and surprised by the sheer number of, uh, of Chinese people out on the seas learning to sail. So who knows, maybe the next Olympic champion could come from Qingdao itself. Qingdao was chosen as the site for the sailing competitions of the 2008 Beijing Olympics. The problem was, the city had no yacht clubs or sailing centres. So a 45-acre venue had to be created from scratch at a cost of $470 million on the site of a former shipyard. Despite sailing being relatively new to China, its popularity is burgeoning at an exponential rate. A fact clearly illustrated by the vast numbers of Chinese spectators that turned out for the Olympic events. This has helped the sport develop at grassroots level, as has the conversion of the Olympic facilities into a marina and sailing school for future Olympic sailors. Right, enough time on the water for one day. Let's go and get a bird's eye view of the city. The Qingdao TV tower is a 232 meter tall transmission tower situated on the top of the Taiping Hill in Julin Park. Built in 1994, the glass observation deck is perfect for some quiet contemplation. If you're feeling a little peckish, head to the revolving restaurant so you can fill up those grumbly stomachs whilst Qingdao revolves around you. And finally, make your way up to the wind-lashed outdoor sightseeing platform on top. Just in case you get quizzed about this place, you should know that it's the third highest steel tower in the world after the Eiffel Tower in France and the Tokyo Tower in Japan. Perfect place to take a break for now and just enjoy the view. Well, they say a picture's worth a thousand words and what a sight to behold. It's a 360 degree view of Qingdao in all of its splendor. And we're lucky enough that today is a gloriously sunny day, which has gone a little bit far enough to make me feel okay about the fact that unfortunately, that's all the time we've got left for today. Really hope you've enjoyed this part of the trip around Qingdao. You've learned a bit of culture and had a bit of fun. I'm Mark Edwards, and I'll catch you very soon on another episode of Travelogue.